Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and this is a reading roundup. In my reading roundup videos, I uh, talk about the books that I have been reading recently. And in this video, I want to talk about nine books I've read recently that aren't related to Victober. So let's just dive right in. I read Too Close to Breathe by Olivia Kiernan. This is a debut novel by this author from 2018. Um, this one, I really enjoyed this one. I thought this was a really solid debut novel. It's a police procedural set in Ireland um, where the victim is Eleanor Costello. She is a microbiologist and she is found hanging in her home. The detective is Detective Chief Superintendent Frankie Sheehan. Now she's a really interesting character because she's a Detective Chief Superintendent, so she's very high up in the ranks. She trained um, as a forensic scientist and profiler for four years, and she's been a detective for 17 years, and she's been a Detective Superintendent, I think, for about two years. So she is a very experienced detective. And when this book opens, she, she is just back to work after having been injured on a case pretty severely. So she's mm, a little bit, uh, you know, she's doing, she's doing well physically, but maybe mentally she hasn't quite, um, hasn't quite worked through the, the trauma yet, but she does want to get back to work. Um, and so she, she asks her boss to put her on a case. So he puts her on this, what appeared to be suicide case of the woman hanging in her home. Uh, there was a couple things that I found really interesting about this book. One, um, it was published in 2018, but she has it set in 2011. And I was not able to figure out why. <laughs> So I think like if a book is less than 10 years um, difference between the date that it's set and the publication date, I think what's the difference unless there is something specific that relates to the plot. And there didn't appear to be. So I couldn't figure out why that was and it just, it just kind of like, you know, it was just something I noticed and it was all through the book. I was like, why is it 2011? Why is it 2011? Not a big deal, but I just kind of noticed it. I also thought it was really interesting that it was set in first person present tense because that is very difficult to write and this is a debut novel and I thought she did it really well. There was only one part where she left this first person present tense it was always um, from Detective Sheehan's perspective one time one paragraph where she describes a father and his son who are fishing and the son finds this bag that contains a cell phone and some keys and it's the cell phone of this victim that they've been looking for and then and they hand it into the police so there's actually no real reason for that paragraph to be in there because we find out as soon as Detective Sheehan gets this bag, we find out how it, you know, how it was found and everything. And so I, I wonder if maybe it was just maybe missed <laughs> by the editors. So that was, that was interesting. Um, there are pieces in here that I find fascinating. Um, they delve into the dark web, which I think is so interesting because it's so murky and mysterious. Um, and then the, the one thing that kind of like, eh, at the end, she, the author has her detective, this very experienced detective, make a very rookie mistake that leads to, you know, a dangerous confrontation with the killer. And I can understand that the author wanted to get her to that point. It's just unfortunate that she had her make this rookie mistake that didn't really feel believable after everything else you learned about the detective throughout the book. But that's just a very minor thing. I really enjoyed this book and I would give it four stars and I would look for more from this author. 
And then I read the second in this series, A Fatal Mistake by Faith Martin. This is a series that's set in Oxford in 1960. And the main character is WPC Trudy Loveday. And I, I quite enjoy this series. I think it's really interesting having it set in the 60s in Oxford. And at her station, she is the only female uh, police officer. And so her, her boss doesn't know what to do with her. He keeps putting her on ridiculous assignments because he just doesn't think that she can do what other police constables do. Um, and so uh, in, he has her often go to work for the coroner when the coroner wants to look more closely into a case. He, he needs an actual police officer to do the questions. So her boss often does that for her. One thing that I really enjoyed about the style of writing, I'll get to the plot in a second, but um, the author introduces lots of characters. So you're, you're like, okay, this is kind of like lots of characters, lots of characters. I'm not sure how they fit into the story or connect to each other. But then the author slowly reveals clues and connections, tantalizing the reader with possibilities. And I really enjoyed that. So in this one in particular, um, the coroner uh, had just done um, an inquest into the death of a boy. A student at one of the Oxford colleges was found drowned um, in, the, in the lake. And during the inquest, he just got the impression that a bunch of the students who were at a party on the river uh, weren't telling everything. Um, it seemed like they had all been given a story to tell and the coroner wants to look more uh, closely into it. And so he gets uh, Trudy Loveday to work with him again and they, they investigate the case. And so yeah, I really enjoyed this and I gave it four stars. I felt like a gothic mystery, it's that time of year, and so I thought I would give The Woman in the Mirror a try. This is by Rebecca James and it came out in 2018. And this one was only okay. I, I know what I like in a gothic mystery and this was, this was good, I liked it, but I didn't love it. There are two timelines in this book. We have 1947 where we follow us follow Alice Miller and then um, present day where we follow Rachel Wright. And one thing that I thought was fascinating was Rachel Wright in the present day is written third person past tense. But 1947 Alice Miller is written first person present tense, which I thought was interesting. So anyway, Alice Miller uh, gets a job as a governess at Winterbourne Hall. Um, the father is a widower and he's got two children and it is an isolated, weird house on the coast of Cornwall. See, what is it about Cornwall that just screams gothic? That part I loved about this book. I love it when a gothic uh, mystery is set in Cornwall in Cornwall. <laughs> so, so Alice Miller goes to be a governess at this house where obviously weird things happen. Present day Rachel Wright is, um, she's just opened a gallery in New York and she learns that she is a descendant of the de Grays and heir to Winterbourne House. And so she was adopted as an infant and never knew anything about her birth parents and she's always wanted to know. So she goes right away, she flies over to England um, and goes to Cornwall and uh, kind of starts looking into the house and some of its mysteries. So this one I gave three stars to. It was okay, but not exactly what I'm looking for in a gothic mystery. And then I read uh, the next one in the series for me by Ellie Griffiths. This is The Stone Circle. This is her Ruth Galloway series. Ruth Galloway is an archaeologist um, and she's uh, kind of more more of an instructor than an actual like on-site or archaeologist. Um, but they're set in Norfolk and so I find that very atmospheric and and interesting. In this one, the stone circle, 
there is a connection back to the very first book and the very first case. So I don't want to go into too much information uh, and spoil things for people. Um, but she's got a connection to Detective Chief Inspector Frank Nelson uh, from the police. And so this one I only gave three stars to. I'm finding that the books are becoming much less about the mystery. In this case, bones are discovered. They've, they've, uh, they've found another uh, stone cir circle, um, like kind of it's been buried. And so there, were, there was like ancient bones in there, but then they also found uh, modern day bones. Anyways, um, but the stories are becoming far less about the mystery, which is what I enjoy, and far less about Ruth actually doing work as an archaeologist than about the relationships of all the characters. And oftentimes those relationships drive me crazy. So for example, the will they, won't they, what's the relationship between Ruth Galloway and Frank Nelson is driving me absolutely crazy. I just want some kind of resolution and look, can we just move on? Uh, that's where I am <laughs> at this point in this series. So I, I would probably read the next one because um, I, I live in hope that they'll get better again. I really enjoyed the first ones in the series. So if you like books that are set in that world of archaeology, this could be the series for you. Just know that there is like painful, ongoing, relationship stuff that never seems to resolve itself. Then I read Much Ado About Murder. This is the third in the Shakespeare and Smythe series. I really enjoy this series. There's only four of them and so I'm on the hunt for them. I'd love to have them in my personal library. Each book is loosely connected to a play by Shakespeare and so this one is loosely connected to Much Ado About Murder. So Plague is in town and uh, the theaters are closed. So, uh, Smythe is doing some smithing and uh, Shakespeare is writing some sonnets. So in this one, uh, one of their ex-players comes back to town. Ben Dickin has gone off to be a soldier and he comes back and he introduces everybody to someone that he knows called um, called Master Leonardo and, and Master Leonardo's daughter Hira is engaged, newly engaged to a man called Corwin. Well, Master Leonardo is found dead in his home and um, Corwin has been arrested for the murder. And so Ben Dickin asks Shakespeare and Smythe to help him uh, clear Corwin's name and find the true the true murderer. So I really enjoy this series and I gave I gave this one four stars. And then I just continued on to read the last one in the series, which is The Merchant of Vengeance. So of course the connection here is the, the Merchant of Venice. And so in in this one, um, Ben Dickin, who we met in the previous uh, novel, uh, Shakespeare and Smythe are visiting Ben when a friend of Ben's comes bursting into his place of business all upset because his new engagement is off and he is not allowed to see his fiance because uh, he is Jewish as it turns out. Now his father is an English man and, and a Christian and his mother is Jewish and so that means that uh, that he is Jewish as well. And so, uh, um, so yeah, so they're trying to, to help him figure out what, what he can do about it. And then the father of his fiance is found dead. And so uh, more investigation ensues. There is a lot in here about the underworld in, in London and specifically the Thieves Guild, which was really interesting. And like I said, I really like this series. I gave this one four stars as well. And I'm kind of sad that there were only ever four books in this series. And then I read the first book in the Henry Gamage, 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 uh, I'm not sure how to say his name, series by Elizabeth Daly. 
This is a series that was written in the 40s. I believe there are 16 books in this series. And Henry Gamage is a rare book expert and gentleman sleuth. And I picked up this book because I had to find an, a new series to read that was kind of a, about books. And he's a book um, expert, a book sleuth. Uh, however, in this first book of the series, there's re really very little about books, but you're introduced to Henry. He's on vacation in Maine and he meets um, this family. So he is at the Barclays when their relatives arrive late at night. And so so Henry's is at Henry is at the Barclays. Colonel and Mrs. Barclay and their son Lieutenant Frederick Barclay. Um, when their relatives arrive, they are the Cowdens, Amberly Cowden, his sister, um, and their mother, and then Amberly's tutor. Now, Amberly is the heir to a vast fortune, but he does not come into the money until he comes of age, and his birthday is at midnight. And so uh, Henry meets these people, then he goes to the hotel, and then it turns out that the Cowden party is also staying at the same hotel. And the next morning, Amberly's body is found on the cliffs, uh, and he's dead. And it would appear that he died just a couple hours after he came of age. Therefore, he came into his money, but then he died. So it would go to, to uh, the next in line, which is his sister. Um, this was really good, actually. Uh, this was written in 1940. It was very interesting. Um, and I didn't guess kind of the shenanigans and uh, who the killer was. I, I, I thought it was really good. And even though there wasn't a whole lot about books in this one, um, Henry uses his skills as um, a forgery expert to help solve the crime, and I would definitely continue with this series. Then I read The Rose of York, Crown of Destiny by Sandra Wirth. This is the second in a trilogy about Richard III, but the library did not have the first in the, the trilogy, so I had to start here, which was okay. And um, I really enjoyed this one. It is super short. It is only 165 pages, but it covers seven years of history. <laughs> so 17, four, 1476 to 1483. So for the majority of this book, Richard is still Duke of Gloucester. He does not become the king until like very late in the book, I think page 93. So if you know anything about the War of the Roses, then you would be familiar with the events um, in this book. I'm not super f familiar with that era, era of history, um, but I do know that this author takes a very definite view of Richard III. So there's the group that says he's evil and he killed the princes in the tower and all of that. And then there's the other group that say, no, he was kind of, you know, a really good king and all of that. And so she's on that side of, of the argument. I thought it was really good. I thought for such a short book and so much history, she did a good job. So, um, like 1483 starts on page 93 in the book. So six years of history are covered in 92 pages. And I thought she did a good job. She just kind of picked um, bits that were really important that led up to Richard being the king and uh, she kind of told a lot of history succinctly and well. It was interesting and um, I really think like she did a good job of highlighting uh, Richard's sense of justice and how important that was for him. Something that I think is not well known is that Richard III um, was the guy who brought in kind of our current idea of the justice system. So trial by jury, innocent until proven guilty, all of that, that was Richard III. And I'm not entirely sure why more of that isn't talked about. And so um, I thought that was really interesting. Um, and so I gave this um, four stars 
and I'm going to uh, get the third in the trilogy out from the library as well and, and finish it off. And then finally, I read Dark Queen Rising by Paul Doherty. He published this in 2018. And interestingly, I think this also is set during the War of the Roses, but this one is set about 10 years previous to the opening of this one. So Richard, Duke of Gloucester is a character in this, but he is not the main character. The main character is Margaret Beaufort. So again, I don't know a ton of the history surrounding the War of the Roses, but if you are a fan of the War of the Roses, then this could be this could be a, the book for you. Uh, so this is set in May 1471. The War of the Roses are reaching their bitter and bloody climax. Edward of York has claimed the English throne and his followers are exacting a savage revenge on those who supported the Lancastrian cause. Surrounded by enemies whatever, wherever she turns, the position of Margaret Beaufort, Countess of Richmond, and mother to Henry Tudor, the last remaining hope of the House of Lancaster, is precarious to say the least. Determined to protect her son, whatever it takes, Margaret must rely on her sharp-witted clerk, Christopher Alswick, to be her eyes and ears. When four bodies are discovered in a London tavern, their throats slit, and Margaret herself is suspected of being behind the crime, it's up to Alswick to prove his mistress's innocence and unmask the real killer. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of history in here. There is a mystery, but it doesn't, like that murder doesn't take place until about halfway through, halfway through the book. But it's interesting because it's a locked room <laughs> mystery. So yeah, I really enjoyed this one too. And I gave it four stars. So what do you think? Have you read any of these books? I would love to chat with you about that in the comment section down below. Do any of these books sound intriguing to you? I would love to hear about that as well. And I will see you for another video soon. Bye.